The Inadequacy of Natural Realism by Durant Drake. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A few years ago, idealism in one form or another seemed to have definitely won the day in philosophy. But very recently, the realistic heresy has sprung up again, and it is now rampant at Columbia, at Harvard, and at many another American university. It is even gaining ground in orthodox England. This contemporary movement, called by some of its leaders natural or naive realism, is in large measure a reaction against the excesses of absolute idealism. The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. Realism calls a halt to the building of metaphysical air castles, and bids us keep our feet on terra firma. To all who long to see philosophy forsake irresponsible speculation and cleave to a surer, if slower, procedure, it is a welcome change. But just what terra firma is, how we may most accurately describe it, in the large is not an easy matter to settle. In the opinion of the writer of this paper, natural realism gives us an inaccurate and inadequate account of the facts and must be supplanted by a critical realism which shall be based on the insight which idealism has contributed to philosophy there are as a matter of fact several mutually incompatible theories in the field each of which purports to represent the instinctive realism of the natural man these theories are not always kept distinct and the difficulties in the way of one theory are often met by an unconscious shift of base to a point of view which is really quite different the particular type of natural realism here opposed may possibly when the full light of day is let in upon it find no champions so much the better then we shall have got out of the way a theory which even if not consistently held by any of our contemporary realists figures largely in their writings and gives much of its plausibility to their position this particular type of realism then is that most natural of all realisms the belief that the very data which we have in experience slip out of experience and continue to exist with the same qualities when no one's experience includes them it would seem to be the belief indicated by professor montague's contention agreed to by the notable six that things known may continue to exist unaltered when they are not known it is the belief that the this which the idealist calls content of experience is the very object which the physicalist speaks of as out there as the cause of our experience by a critical realism on the other hand is meant a realism which holds that the this of experience the object perceived is numerically and qualitatively different from and exists later in time than the thing in itself which causes the experience a realist has much in common with idealists of the stamp of Berkeley and Mill. Idealist and critical realist believe that these data which they have and describe exist only as elements of this particular experience, whereas to the natural realist the data of experience are permanent existences, someone's experience now in no one's. Their consideration which parts the critical realist from the idealist the latter holding that the cosmos is merely a construct that there are no absent objects save in the sense of permanent possibilities of sensation while the former believes in a cosmos which really exists in the same sense in which this now of experience exists the difference between the natural realist and the critical realist is then that the former's universe is made up of the very thises of human experience eked out with other contiguous thises whereas the latter's universe is made up of realities which are pictured to some extent by the thises of experience but lie beyond them to the former a man's experience when he looks at the starry heavens really includes a large percentage of the cosmos to the latter it is but a momentary phase of this particular human experience which bears the same relation to the universe as the man's body or brain does to other physical things to the natural realist there is just this world that we see and touch with our individual experiences flitting about in it 
like searchlights illuminating portions of it that preexisted. To the critical realist, all the things I see and touch are but visual and tactile experiences within my total experience. Each total experience is a microcosm, surrounded by a sea of things in themselves, which never come within human experience at all. The macrocosm is much bigger than the natural realist imagines. It includes the separate streams of consciousness with their subjective and objective experiences, and in between them a world of ejective realities which those reduplicated objective experiences more or less fragmentarily picture. It must be confessed that the prima facie plausibility is with the natural realist, and the label of his system therefore legitimate. Our contemporary realists never tire of telling us that their view is the natural, instinctive belief of all men, and frankly shift the burden of proof to the shoulders of the sophisticated critic, who would deny the belief of the natural man, whose heart is pure of metaphysics. Now some of us are strongly inclined to suspect that your natural man is hopelessly unanalytic, and that if philosophy has any useful function in the world, it consists largely in correcting his notions and making distinctions where his vague and intermittent reflection has discovered none. Moreover, the natural man is an unreliable witness to put one's trust in. He has been made sponsor to not a few theories for which we may well doubt his willingness to be responsible. At the outset, he gives his unguarded assent, but when close inspection reveals all that the theory implies, he backs out. The writer's experience with such natural men as he has caught is that when the implications of natural realism are relentlessly unfolded, they reject it with horror. Whither will the natural realist turn, then, if his own witness betrayeth him? It is significant that reflection has never been long satisfied with natural realism. It is precisely the difficulties in this obvious view that have precipitated many philosophic struggles. There are grave reasons why we must pass on beyond the surface look of things if we wish to construct a world picture compatible with all the facts. To the natural man's assertion that we have our world in common, which is the contention of the natural realist, we have to reply, how do you know that we do? And we can go on to say, there are cogent reasons for denying that we do in the strict sense. We live in a common world, but each of us is shut off from the rest of the world by the wall that surrounds his own consciousness. Our visual and tactile experiences are within the wall and only represent what is without. We do not strictly have any this in common. The reasons for making this denial we shall proceed to note. 1. When we examine our data, we find that what we have at any moment, what we then know at first hand to exist, is not a world, but a very limited field. We have, e.g., one side of a room, a bodily pain, a wish, and a vague background of other elements, and we have these things existing together. Whatever else may exist beyond this little circle of reality is really beyond it, is shut off from it, does not exist in that relation of felt togetherness with these elements in which they exist with one another. It is partly at least because of this primary fact that the conception of consciousness has been framed. Consciousness is this little field of reality that is present here, in contrast with a bigger world believed in beyond it. Or, if you please, consciousness is this particular relation, that of felt togetherness, which exists between these few data here. Whatever may be beyond this little field does not exist in this relation to the elements within the field, and can be proved not to. For the relation is precisely that of being felt together. And if those other elements are not felt together with these, then they do not exist in that relation with these. Your wishes and bodily pains, e.g., are not felt together with mine. They exist in a separate field. I may speak of knowing your mind, but I can only mean that I know more or less about what is in your mind. In a sense, I may say I have the same feelings, but that must not blind us to the simple, primal fact that those very feelings which you are having, your bodily pain, your wish, are not felt with, 
do not exist in this relation of felt togetherness with my pains and wishes as my pains and wishes do exist with the other simultaneous elements in my field it may be said that the absence of perceiving a relation is not the same as perceiving the absence of a relation but that objection ignores the peculiar nature of this relation which is nothing but that of being felt together it is not the perceiving of a relation but the existence of the relation that is in question suppose then you and i both say i see this tree i have a this within my field which i call this tree it exists in the relation of felt togetherness with all the other simultaneous elements in this field with for example a wish of mine you likewise have a this within your experience which you call this tree it exists in the relation of felt togetherness with a bodily pain of yours now the this tree in my field does not exist in the relation of felt togetherness with that bodily pain as it does exist in that relation with my wish the difference here is ultimate and indisputable can be verified by any simple act of introspection and if it is granted the theory of natural realism is definitively refuted by the logical canon of identity the this tree in the one field exists in the relation of felt togetherness with a certain bodily pain the this tree in the other field does not exist in the relation of felt togetherness with that bodily pain a this tree that is in a certain relation cannot be a this tree that is not in that relation therefore they are not the same this tree element the this of your experience cannot be identical with the this of my experience they are two experiences similar no doubt but numerically different one in your field in your experience in your consciousness as you prefer to put it the other in mine the two fields do not overlap and include common elements the world is as the idealist maintains a world of separate microcosms the natural realist and the absolutist have much in common sworn foes as they are they take common cause here and maintain that though i do not feel this tree element with the bodily pain they nevertheless are felt together by you or by the absolute leaving out the implications of personal pronouns and capitalized absolutes this means that though a felt togetherness between these two elements doesn't exist here it exists somewhere else but that it doesn't exist here as a part of the felt togetherness of this field is what we are affirming there exists here and now a felt togetherness that extends so far and no farther this field of felt togetherness does not include that pain there is no boundary anywhere within this field what is anywhere within it is in the felt together relation with what is anywhere else within it but there is a boundary about it that shuts out that pain if there were not all the rest of your field would be felt together with my field our two consciousnesses would coalesce we should be for the time one person what need then of laborious mind reading or elusive telepathy the fact of this wall this psychological horizon this boundary to a field is a perfectly definite fact not to be glossed over such a wall exists between this tree number one and that pain it does not exist between this tree number two and that pain psychology has not been talking in meaningless terms and speaking of my sensation and yours i have avoided this phraseology which might be deemed partisan but the facts stand out nevertheless the world will not be squashed down so small as the natural realists wish there remains my walled-in field and yours and everybody else's which never overlap or intersect two this truth comes out still more vividly from a consideration of the qualitative difference between my this tree experience and yours data which are qualitatively different cannot be numerically identical and no this in my experience can ever be exactly the same qualitatively as any this in your experience at the same moment could not be unless our bodies were exactly alike and occupied the same place in space 
i. e., in idealistic terms, unless every element in our two experiences were identical, in which case we should be one and the same person. My present, this tree, may be, for example, a small, indistinct, bluish object, while yours may be simultaneously a large, distinct, gray and green object. A small, bluish this is not a large, green and gray this. There is, of course, a practical sense in which we may call them different aspects of the same object, the object being thus a construct. All of these this tree experiences have the same function in our experience and, according to critical realism, represent one thing in itself in the real world. But these different data are not the same datum. They are very different existences. So when I have that tactile experience of roughness, roundness, and hardness, etc., which I also call this tree, I have a datum utterly disparate from the visual this tree. The two thises go together, the one always being a sign of the other. They have, again, the same function, occupy the same point in the conceived objective order, but they are totally different data. They may all be thought to exist, as the natural realist believes they do, permanently and independent of their togetherness with the rest of my experience, but they would not be the same thing. It is their function that is identical, not their being. What exists is a vast number of qualitatively different thises, evanescent according to our theory, permanent according to natural realism. On any theory, we only have them as evanescent and must recognize that no two of them are exactly alike. If we believe, then, that each of these thises that we have in experience is a permanent existence, we have a marvelously multiplied world. A thousand, a million different thises permanently exist as this tree. Disparate as they are, they cannot be squeezed down into one simple object, and we have a world reduplicated ad infinitum. On our theory, the really external objects, i.e. the ejects, are simple existences, and these millions of thises exist merely, as we discover them, as transient bits of our human experience. But, just as the absolute, if it is to include all the contents of all our minds, must contain a million reduplications of this tree, so nature, on the theory we are combating, must contain a million trees where we thought there was one. Such a reduplication, the literal carrying out of the natural realist contention that this, this very this of experience, exists permanently is repugnant even to the view of the natural man, who, if he unwarily agrees with the natural realist's first assertion, agrees rather with us when the implications of the two theories are shown. We give him a simple, homogeneous external world. Natural realism does not. 3. Among the other possible objections to natural realism, there is one that may be briefly mentioned here, the time objection. When I look at a star, the critical realist expresses the facts as follows. Within my field of experience or consciousness exists this visual element, a twinkling point of light out there. The real star, the star in itself, is separated by a long succession of events, pictured by the million-mile-long ether line of the physicist, from this experience of a twinkling point out there. Suppose this star burned out or whatever stars in themselves do that we call burning out, a thousand years ago. This experience of mine is nevertheless a reality now. But, according to natural realism, it is the real star which my experience now wraps around and includes, not a something which represents it. That is to say, my experience now includes something which, unless we reject the conclusions of astronomy, does not exist now, has not existed for a thousand years. The qualitative difference between this twinkling point of light and the real star so vast and complex should have taught us that the one is but a picture or sign of the other. The gap between their existence and time should be conclusive evidence. Of course, what is true so strikingly in the case of the star is true less strikingly, but nonetheless true in the case of all objects. The real object always exists earlier in time than the perceived object, which we hastily assume to be the real object, 
yet which is really but an element in our own experience, and not the object or eject which exists in and for itself. 4. We have been arguing so far about the world of objects or objective experiences. Meeting the natural realist on his own ground and seeking to show him that we have more of a reduplication than he realizes, and that if this reduplication is a matter not of evanescent existence in human experience, but of permanent existence, we get not a single homogeneous world, but as many different worlds as we have experiences. Which is the better explanation of our experience of objects? A million streams of human experience with a sea of simple things in themselves in between, so to speak? or a million worlds. We may now point out, however, that natural realism is at its best when talking of physical objects. The theory was obviously framed to explain them. It proves much more inadequate when we wish to explain the subjective elements in our experience, wishes, hopes, intentions, dreams, ideas, memories, and the rest. Now these elements of experience are perhaps as numerous and perhaps as important as the objective elements. And until an explanation of their existence is forthcoming, this theory is much less plausible than our critical realism, which offers a consistent explanation of their origin and relation to the objective elements. What sort of existence can a wish or a memory have outside of a conscious experience? Various fantastic theories have been put forward by the natural realists to account for these inner experiences. Not having any observable place in the spatial world, they are relegated according to some accounts, to a non-spatial world which simultaneously exists, elements from both worlds joining together to form experience. How this taking partners occurs remains vague. How, moreover, in a world of objects, experience of those objects can come in, where it comes in from and goes to, is a mystery. This peculiar relation of togetherness in a field which is consciousness how does it come to exist in a world of spatial and temporal relations? We have not space here to describe how critical realism explains these important facts. We shall merely assert that it has an explanation, and remind the natural realist that until he has one, his theory is far from rounded out to such a dealing with the whole situation as shall command our attention. According to critical realism, our fragmentary objective experiences are not parts of the really external world. They are pictures in our consciousness, or experience, of fragments of a homogeneous world which is really external to our experience and never comes within it at all. The conclusions of physical science are expressed in terms of our experience, but hold good symbolically of the world of things in themselves which form the real environment of a human conscious experience. This doctrine meets the need which natural realism cannot meet, and which idealism does not try to meet, but which all men feel, of believing in a real, simple, homogeneous external world surrounding our narrow fields of experience. Whether the doctrine is true, and what the positive arguments are which support it, would be matter for another paper. End of The Inadequacy of Natural Realism by Durant Drake